I want to share with you a message, and I'm actually I'm going to be, this is going to be a series, and so I'm going to kind of, in some ways, give you a little outline of it today, but, but there are two points particularly that I want to really focus on about there are things <clears throat> that God forgets, but there are other things that God never forgets. Now, you have to understand that God's forgetting and God's not forgetting is not based on a whim. Well, I'm going to forget this or I'm not going to forget this. It's based on his character. It's based on his character. It's based on who he is. And, and so I'm going to show you a couple of things today from the Word of God. And first I want to talk to you about there are things that God does not forget. Now, I, I can't preach all of this, and I'm not going to attempt to. Uh, I'm just going to kind of cover a couple of these and so you can understand where I'm going with this. <clears throat> but one thing God doesn't forget is he never forgets the humble. Psalm, Psalm 9 verse 12 says that he does not forget the cry of the humble. Amen. That's why the Bible says you're to humble yourself yeah. under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in, good, in due time. Something else God doesn't forget are his enemies. Yeah, thank you for your enthusiasm. Yeah, Psalm 74, 22 says, Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies, the tumult of those who rise up against you and increase continually. Now, you might say, well, you know, we're in the New Testament now. God loves everybody. He gave, the whole, gave uh, His Son for the whole world. He loves everybody. He has enemies. Yeah. If you don't believe it, go read Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3 and find out where Jesus talked about those who were enemies. Yeah. Go read Paul's gospel about those he called the enemies of the gospel. Yeah. In fact, it says over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 6, now listen to this. You can listen to it if I read it to you, I guess, can't you? <laughs> it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, It is a righteous thing with God to repay tribulation to those who trouble you. Now, that might shock you. You say, uh, 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 Pastor, uh, I don't, w w what do you mean by that? There are things, listen, there are things that God doesn't forget, and He does not forget His enemies. He does not forget those, listen to me, who are against Him or against His gospel. Don't kid yourself. Doesn't mean He doesn't want, love them and want them to come to Christ, but let me tell you something. You don't want to mess with God. Amen, amen. Not only that, you don't want to be messed with God's family. All right. Okay, I've said all I'm going to say about that tonight. You'll have to come back to hear the rest of it, all right? God doesn't forget the poor. You know, I think sometimes, and don't get upset with this if you ain't got any money, but I think sometimes you have more favor with God when you're poor than when you're rich. Because it says a lot of bad things about rich people if they don't do right with what they have. But God always remembers the poor. He never forgets the poor. Psalm 74, 9 says, don't forget the life of your poor forever. Something else God doesn't forget. He never forgets his covenant Leviticus 26, 45 says, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am their Lord. Ezekiel 16, 60 says, My covenant with you is that from the days of you, I will remember my covenant with you from the days of your youth. I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. I don't know whether you even understand covenant or not, but let me tell you what covenant is. Covenant is when God says, I promise you this is the way it's going to be. And if you're in a covenant with God, that's the way it's going to be. 
Say, well, I don't have a covenant of God. Are you a Christian? Well, yes. Then the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, this is a covenant that I will make with you after those days, says the Lord. You have a covenant. And God never, ever forgets his covenant. Woo, I am so glad. I tell you, the Bible says, listen to this, that the promises of God are in Christ, yes, and amen. He never wavers from his covenant. He never wavers from what he says, I will do. People say, well, Jesus hadn't come back yet. He's coming. How do you know? Because I have a covenant. God's promised. In fact, the Bible says he swore by himself. That's pretty strong. All right, I'm going to preach on that if I don't move on. But we'll get to it. Amen. So he never forgets his covenant. Now listen to this. You ready? Listen to me. He never forgets you. You may think God's the furthest, you're the furthest thing from God's thoughts, and you are mistaken. The Bible says in Isaiah 49, I love this in verse 14, it says in verse uh, uh, 15, it says, can a woman, now listen to this, verse 15, verse 16, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely she may forget, yet I will not forget you. I have inscribed on the palms of my hands, your walls are continually before me. I won't ever forget you. I won't forget you. I always remember you. I won't ever give up on you. I won't ever forget you. I'm glad God's in, that I'm on God's mind. Uh, how about you? Now, see, if you don't think he is, you don't understand God. You're his creation. He's not going to forget you. One of the scriptures, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Hebrews, is over in Hebrews chapter 13 in verse 5. It says, the Amplified Bible says it this way. Listen. God himself has said, now, this, I'm reading the scripture. God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, or leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. He doesn't forget you. I tell you, everybody else may forsake you, and you may think you're all by yourself and your friends and your family, and nobody's even talking to you, but God will talk to you. He won't forget you, ever. All you have to do is just know, hey, he'll never forget me. He'll never forget me. Now, those are all things I'm going to preach in the future, so that's good, isn't it? Now you have a preview. All right, here's, here's, here's the last um, doesn't forget, okay? How, how about that, okay? He doesn't forget your work and your labor of love. All right, now I want you to see this video real quick, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you about it.
Listen, that happened in four days. That could not have been done without your work and your labor of love. Couldn't happen. And listen to me. Listen to the word of God. One thing God doesn't forget is your work and your labor of love. It is important for you to understand, and I'm your pastor, and I'm tell, I've got to tell you the truth, that you work for the kingdom of God. Okay? God doesn't forget your work and your labor, but God also doesn't forget when you don't work for the kingdom. So, well, it doesn't matter. You know, everything's going to be sorted out in heaven. Y y you may not want to talk like that. Because I'm going to tell you something. First of all, the Bible says there are going to be tears in heaven. Second thing is you're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I, as your pastor, am going to have to give personal account for you. Yeah. And I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell Jesus. I said, Jesus, I told them. I, you know I did. I'll have my own visit too. I understand that. But you understand what I'm saying. But the point is, that, that God doesn't forget your work and your righteous labor of love for the kingdom of God. It is something that is important to him. It is something that he values. It is something that he looks for and he records. And I'm going to show you this from the word of God today. It is important that you understand that. The word of God is, is replete with examples of those who work for the kingdom of God. But let me just show you this from a little unusual standpoint, okay? You go over to Revelation chapter 2, and, the, and, and Jesus dealt with seven churches, okay? Churches. Everybody say churches. churches. So you like church when we're just talking about it, but you are the church, okay? So he dealt with seven churches. In those seven churches, something unusual pops to the front Every time. Okay? The first church was Ephesus. It's called the Loveless Church. They were very, very legalistic. Okay? It says in verse 2 of that church, I know your works, your labor, your patience. Are y'all still here? But here's the other thing about it. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, now, now you've got to hear this. Listen to me today. <clears throat> He's going to always deal with us, but he also always recognizes our works. Well, you're talking about works. We, we don't get to heaven on works. It's not about getting to heaven on works. It's about going to heaven and working because you're going. Somehow we get the idea, well, you're just trying to put me under the law, making me work. I'm not making you work. I'm just telling you what's going to happen if you don't. Yes, yes. You, you decide. But God is looking for, hungry for, rewards gospel workers, yes. people who work in the kingdom of God. And you don't think that that was work 2,777 2, hours of ministering to people, it was work. God doesn't forget that. It is part of him, his DNA to receive that and to record that. All the churches, the same thing happened to them. You go over to chapter, uh, go over to, to verse 8 and verse 9, and you find the persecuted church in Smyrna. And you know what the Lord said? I know your works. I know your works. I know what you've been doing. Listen, I, I, I know we don't do everything we're supposed to do. I don't think anybody's capable of that. But I sure hope Jesus says, uh, I know your works for missions. I, I know your work for the poor. I know your work to reach people for the gospel. I, 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 I want to see that. And so what do you do in order for that to happen? You work. You work. You do something. So Jesus told them, I, hey, I, I just want, I know your works. 
I, I know your works. Thank God. All right. But look, there's another church. There's a church at Pergamum. It was a compromising church. Guess what the Lord told him in verse 13? I know your works. Hey, I know what you're doing. And he spelled it out for him. He said, look, you, I know what you're doing. I don't have time to get into it today. But he, he was pretty clear. Then you got the corrupt church, the church of Thyatira. Guess what he told them in verse 19? I know your works. I know what you're doing. Are y'all still with me? Amen. It's important that you hear what I'm saying today. Revelations chapter 3, it was a dead church at Sardis. Guess what the Lord told them? Probably you can't ever guess in a million years. Huh? <laughs> I know your works. And he said, I haven't found them completely. I, I like the way. I, I, I know your works, uh, but, but uh, I, I haven't found your works perfect before God. Are y'all hearing this? Now, let me just, so you'll understand. He's not talking to me or to the pastor of the church. He's talking to the church. You are the church. Oh, thank God this isn't my church. Are you saved? Yes, then you're the church. You, can't, you can run, but you can't hide. Aren't you? But now, in Revelations chapter 3, in verse 15... This is the church at Laodicea. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible, verse 15, so you'll understand this. So listen to this. I know your record of works and what you are doing. You are neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Their works caused Jesus to respond in a powerful way toward them. I wish you'd do something. Is this Presbyterian church today? Y'all are awfully quiet all of a sudden. So you have to understand and realize that God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love. He's recording it. He's keeping up with it. And every, now listen, this is everyday stuff here. Every time you know you're supposed to do something, and let me just tell you, that there's plenty of work in the church. Okay, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but there's plenty of things to do that, that where you can serve, where you can do something, where you can work, whether it be just in a, in, in a situation like this over this four days. And by the way, that's not enough to carry you through the year. I worked beyond the grave. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> You have to know that there is a recording. And I'm going to read you a, 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 a scripture out of God's Word translation. And um, I want you just to listen to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22. Paul is writing, and he says, We have also sent them, our Christian brother, whom we have often tested in many ways and found to be dedicated, a dedicated worker. Did you notice here it says we have often tested in many ways and found to be a dedicated worker? And we find that he's much more dedicated now even because he has so much confidence in you. I want to tell you the greatest joy of a pastor other than people getting saved is watching dedicated workers. I could name people in this church, and I'm not going to because I know I'd miss somebody, that I see day after day after day working, dedicated workers. But you know the amazing thing about it is that's how God wants all of us. Because what you do as a worker for the Lord is far greater than anything you'll ever accomplish on this earth. 
the reward that you'll receive is far greater than anything you could accomplish. Because you are dedicated, whether, whether, listen, whether it's the choir, the choir they sing. If you come to the Freedom Crusade, they'll stand up for two hours at a time. They practice hard. The ushers take all kinds of abuse. <laughs> Hopefully not from you. We have greeters. We have children's workers, youth workers. We have all, hey, we let you mow the lawn if you wanted to. If we could, could, could depend on you doing it every time. I'll do it. Yeah, you mow it one time and then we'd have to go hire somebody. No, it says dedicated workers. You, you think labor just means, you know, while well, preaching the gospel has nothing. Really, it's the support of the ministry. That's what the Lord wants. Go read Romans chapter 16 sometime and just read the commendation that Paul made to all the people that worked and how they labored. And they did different things, but they worked and they labored. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 15 says, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruit of Acacia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You know that word devoted there is the word addicted? You know, you can actually get addicted to the work of the kingdom. I got addicted early when I got saved. I got addicted before I ever preach one message before I ever did one thing I got addicted to serving the church and until I was called to the full time ministry I was addicted to serving wherever I was even when I go preach somewhere else I'm addicted to serving that's what the Lord's looking for and we, we've seen that we've found that Come on. Somebody singing there. We saw that in, at work, you know, at, at Beyond the Grave. And, and look, if you're waiting for me to kind of point you, say, well, I need you to do this or need you to do that, really you ought to be saying, what can I do? Well, I don't want to do what you told me I had. Well, there you go. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Now, I'm going to read you the way it says it in the Greek. The Amplified Bible says it this way too. So that they can do the work of the ministry for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. There is a dynamic that God is looking for in a local church. And we've, listen, I'm not, I'm not preaching this because you don't work. Because I've just shown you, you do. But if everybody did something, if everybody got involved, there is a dynamic that works. It causes an increase to the body. It's like a snowball. And when it starts rolling, it just gathers more and gathers more and gathers more. That's an operation of the local church. That's not an operation of my preaching. That's an operation of the body of Christ working. When I, when I saw all of those people working at, uh, at, um, at the Fall Fest, we did that. We did that whole Fall Fest. Okay, don't get upset when I say this. We didn't do it for you or your kids. We did it for that 109 families who'd never been. And we already have some of them joining the church, some of them coming, being a part. See, but hey, not very many people can cook hot dogs and hamburgers like Lawrence. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, man, he knows he does it. But I, I'm still upset with him because he usually fixes me some ribs on the side and he didn't this time. But, <laughs> but how hard is it to hold a plate while he puts the hamburger in it? I watched people sitting, and I saw someone in a wheelchair serving. I watched people just making cotton candy, just doing all kinds of things, playing with those kids in those games. 
You don't think that's gospel work. You're mistaken. It is. And, and, and my job is to equip you to do it. That's why I'm telling you that today. That's, that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do is to tell you and, and show you how to do it and be involved. The, the, there is a viable, people want, I want the gifts of the Spirit. I want the gifts of the Spirit. Good. I'm going to get you the Ministry of Helps gift. You know there is a, there is a gift? Yeah. Okay. Just so you know. Amen. So God doesn't forget, and I just want to tell you today, He'll never forget what you did this past week in, uh, week in, in the past weekend. He'll never forget it. Why? Because it was a labor of love. Some of you gave up your own Halloween so you could come, you know, you could come serve others. God will never forget your work at Beyond the Grave, being a counselor, being a car, in a parking lot, being an usher, being a part of the cast, being in the nursery, whatever. God will never forget it. He doesn't forget those kind of things. Now, there are some things God forgets. There are some things God forgets, and I'm going to talk to you about one of them. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I am so glad he doesn't remember my sins. But now here's the thing I want you to see. Listen to this. I said, boy, that's a big switch. Well, it, it is in a way, but not really. We're talking about the same God. It says here that he blots out your transgressions for his sake. For his sake. Not, not certainly for your sake, but, but he did it for his own sake. Why? Because he had to do it in order to still be able to love you and minister to you. Otherwise, he'd have killed you. You'd be dead. This thing would be over with. You remember when all the people got disobedient? He, you know, and the world was just going, just going to pot. And, and, the Lord said, and the Lord said, I'm going to kill everybody. Why was he going to kill them? Because of their transgressions, because of their sin. It was coming up before God as an accusation. He created. Listen, you've got to understand something. God created man, and now that man that he created is going against him and living in sin, and it comes up against God. So he's got two options. He's either going to kill you or he's going to forgive you and forget it. He said, he, he said, I'm going to kill everybody. And then the Bible says he found, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he didn't kill. Then he told Moses, he said, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. I'm killing every one of them. Those stinking rebellious people, I'm killing them. And Moses said, now, Lord, you can't do that. If you do that, think about what everybody's going to say about you. So he really forgives and forgets our sin for his own sake. For his own sake. Why? Because he loves you. Isn't that crazy? Excuse me, Lord. I don't mean to call you crazy. But, <laughs> but, but he loves us in spite of the fact that we want to go against him. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's just amazing to me that that love is still there because he created us. It says in Ephesians... Chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, Amplified Bible says it this way. God, so rich is He in His mercy, because of and in order to satisfy His great and wonderful and intense love wherewith He loves us. For His own sake, He forgets. He doesn't remember. He puts it aside. Not only that, it says in Ephesians in verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. 
and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only is he forgetting our sin, listen to me, he brought us in the big house. He brought us in the big house. I mean, we're living in the mansion. We're not living in servants' quarters. We're living in the mansion. You know, when I, when I was raised in Mississippi, we lived in a little old shotgun house. And you know what a shotgun house is, don't you? You shoot a shotgun and it goes in the front door and out the back. And, and right, just right there next to us, we lived almost in the shadow of a mansion. Man, I always dreamed about what would it be like to live in that big old house. And then I found out the people in it were crazy, and I didn't want to live there. But, <laughs> but, but I thought about that big, I mean, it was a mansion. It had the big, you know, southern pole, you know, post, this beautiful, big old mansion. We've been brought into the big house. We don't live in the shadow of it. We live in it. And God did that for his own sake. The only way he could get that done was to forget your sins, to let go of them, to put them away by the blood of Jesus. Micah 7, 19 says that he would cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Psalm 107, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Ezekiel 18, 22 says, None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. That's our God. That's our God. He, he, he has a desire just to wipe away your challenge to him. Jeremiah says, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sins I will remember no more. That's God. That's God. All right, but now listen to me a minute. If God forgot them, are y'all still with me? If God forgot them, then you should too. Why are you beating yourself over the head over something that happened that God sent his son to die for? Now see, some people say, well, you say that, that means everybody's going to continue to sin. Then you're going to continue to be challenging God. And you don't want to go there because your life is going to be miserable. Listen, God doesn't hate sin because it hurts him, it's because it hurts you. Well, you know, the Lord understands, I know, but you're still going to get destructive actions in your life when you sin. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live under condemnation and guilt over your past and over things that you have done in your past and, and, it, and, it, and it control your life. I just want to tell you right now, listen, I, there is no way I could stand up here and communicate with you the gospel if I had to deal with the sin that I committed before I got saved. Every once in a while, I'll remember something I did, and I just shake my head and I say, Thank God I'm forgiven. Thank God I'm forgiven. I am not going to think about that. That's not part. Because, see, the devil will get you to thinking about stuff you did, how bad it was. Oh, you did this. Well, you did that. Next thing you know, you're saying, well, I might as well keep doing it. Yeah. No. If he forgot it, you forget it. Amen. Quit living in it. Don't let it control your life. Don't let it control who you are. The Bible says that because of Jesus, listen to this, Sin no longer has dominion over me. I don't have to sin. Doesn't mean I don't, but I don't do anywhere near what I used to. I mean, that much compared to that much. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
So why would you want to live under the guilt and the condemnation and the burden of sin in your life? Why would you want it to control your life? Why would you want it to have any place in your life? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sin, He is just and faithful, I like the Amplified Bible, according to His righteous character. Y'all still here? To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not going to talk to you about sin that you committed yesterday when you've asked Him to forgive you. He just wants you to quit because it hurts you. Why do you want to live a life where that controls your life? The Apostle Paul said something over in in Philippians chapter 3 in verse 12. He said this, forgetting those things which are behind. I press toward the prize, the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to live in the past. Forgetting. Forgetting. God forgot, forgets. Why can't you? Isaiah 43 verse 18 says this. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. See, listen to me. So many people, even Christians, sin from the past still hangs on into their lives, and they can never go forward and see God do something new in their lives because they won't let go and forget about the old. They won't let it go. They won't get it out of their system. They won't say, hey, if God forgot, I forget, and I'm not going there anymore. I'm not living that way anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. No, I, God's going to do a new thing. The great, the great thing about the gospel is when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, he knew that you could not handle your old life and serve Jesus, so he made you a new creature. Why would you want to live in those old things? That's not what God has for you. That's not God's purpose. That's not God's plan for your life. Now, here's the last part of this. If God forgets sin, then you should too. Now, here it is. Especially when it's somebody else who sinned against you. Let me hear that again. That's right. How can you hold somebody else liable for something God's forgiven you from and you're taking advantage of? You can't do it. You can't do it. No. In fact, the Bible is pretty clear about this. I'll just read you one scripture that that will help you with this. And it says in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Same way God forgave you. Well, I'll tell you what. I've had people tell me this, and I'm that close to calling them an idiot, but I don't. So don't ever say that to me because I might. Listen. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, I forgive them, but I'll never forget. Then you hadn't forgiven them. Why? Because when God forgives, he remembers no more. But it's in my thought process, Pastor. Ask God to purify it. Listen, I've had things, everybody's had things that have hurt them and had people that have hurt them, and I still have those memories, but they're purified. There's no anger there. There's no upset. I, it's over. It's over. It's not part of me anymore. Sometimes people, and I, I've actually had this happen specifically with, and don't get upset with this, but women who've been raped. I'll never forget that man as long as I live. You have to forget him. You have to forgive him, and you have to forgive him, and forget him. Listen, because it doesn't matter what it is, when somebody sins against you, You're letting their sin, their sin, dominate you. Why in the world would you want to do that? I've got enough to deal with of my own. 
but people get somebody does something against them no it could be a hundred things and so now they carry that sin they sin and I'm carrying it I've, I've counseled with people and they get so mad because the person that sinned against them they're going on about their life and I'm the one that's mad I'm the one, that's because you're carrying their sin let it go forget it Go on with your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you, to cleanse you, so that you don't have to live with that in your life. It doesn't have to be part of your life anymore. God forgets. You forget. You release it. You let it go. Don't let it bind you up. Don't let it hold you down any longer in your life. There are things God forgets. And there are things God doesn't forget. And you might want to know the difference. And you might want to understand how his character works in regard to these things. I I want to know, hey, if he ain't thinking about this, ain't no use me messing with it. But if he's still thinking about it, then it's something I've got to deal with in my life. Amen. Amen.